So how do propulsion systems on a jet aircraft work and is their role just limited to providing thrust or do they do more? Let's find out in today's video. Welcome back. In this video we will be talking about something very interesting and that's concerning jet engines on a modern commercial aircraft. As always, every effort will be made to explain the concepts in simple layman's terms. So a jet engine on a modern commercial aircraft is quite a complex bit of machinery as it not only serves the function of rendering propulsion to the aircraft but also powers several other systems on an aircraft such as electrics, hydraulics and pneumatics. Jet engines are gas turbines and they have come a long way since they were first built many decades ago. Simply stated, jet propulsion can be described as a force that is generated in the opposite direction to the flow of gas under pressure which is escaping through an opening or the exhaust. And this principle is essentially governed by Newton's third law of motion which states that for every force acting on a body there is an equal and opposite reaction. The principle of the gas turbine engine is that it propels a mass of air backward which in turn generates an equal forward force. Now force or thrust in the context of jet engines is a function of two things, mass and acceleration. Force is quite simply mass times acceleration. So the force created by the mass of air and its velocity generates a reaction in the opposite direction driving the aircraft forwards. The concept of propulsion is as simple as this. Now in case you're wondering what the difference between velocity and speed is, speed refers to how fast an object is moving whereas velocity is a vector that refers to the rate at which an object changes direction so there is direction involved. Now let's dive into the working principle of a gas turbine. So a gas turbine engine comprises of various stages, there are four induction, compression, combustion and exhaust. Let's see what goes on in each stage and how they contribute to the generation of thrust. Air at atmospheric pressure enters the engine and is compressed. Now compression means an increase in the pressure of air and jet engines commonly employ the use of several stages of compressors leading to the compression of air to very high pressures. Now the illustration here depicts three stages of compressor. We have the low pressure stage, intermediate pressure stage and the high pressure stage. And this compressed air is then inducted into the combustion chamber where fuel is added and burnt. The gas generated through combustion expands in the turbine section which once again comprises several stages. The hot gases in turn drive the compressor and the fan in the front therefore generating thrust. Now, when a compressor and a turbine are joined on one shaft, the unit is called a spool. And gas turbines have multiple spools, so usually two or sometimes even three depending on the engine manufacturer. Rolls-Royce is actually quite famous for designing engines with a triple spool architecture. This is the basic working principle of a gas turbine and the cycle that we just talked about, so induction, compression, combustion and exhaust, is referred to as the Brayton cycle. Now the turbojet is a heat engine where the higher the temperature retained in the combustion, the greater the expansion of the gases and hence the greater the efficiency of the engine. But there is a limit to the amount of heat that can be released into the turbine section uh, from combustion and this limit is imposed by the materials from which parts of the engines, specifically the turbine blades and something called guided vanes are manufactured. Let's understand the concept of bypass ratio of a jet engine. You see, not all the air being inducted from the front of the engine goes through the hot core. So this is the hot core of the engine. In other words, not all the air inducted goes through the compressor, combustion chamber, uh, the turbine and the exhaust. Some of the air being sucked in is simply bypassed around the core. And the bypass ratio is the ratio of the amount of air that is bypassed to the amount of air that passes through the core. 
a low ratio is considered in the region of about 1 to 1 or 2 is to 1. So for every one part of air that goes through the core, two parts of air would bypass it. And by contrast, a high ratio would be around 5 to 1. And today's jet engines are commonly high bypass ratio. Hence, they are bigger as they have a large fan or the low pressure compressor at the front to induct and expel all that bypassed air. Now, while in a low bypass ratio engine, thrust is chiefly contingent on the gases emanating from the turbine section, thrust from a high bypass ratio engine is almost completely dependent on the bypassed airflow, which has high mass and relatively low velocity, hence it's good propulsive efficiency. And high bypass ratio engines tend to be much quieter than their low bypass counterparts, as much of the noise in those older engines is a result of the very high velocity achieved uh, through the axial acceleration of the airflow through the hot core of the engine. Because remember, force or thrust is mass times acceleration. And if mass can be increased, in other words, the mass of the air inducted in by the fan in a high bypass ratio engine, then its acceleration can be reduced to achieve the same amount of force or thrust. Now, an interesting fact about turbines is that they are subject to an enormous amount of stress as a result of the very hot gases and the enormous rotational speeds, which could be in excess of 1,500 feet per second. And the temperatures of the gases driving the turbine can reach as high as 1,700 degrees Celsius. This calls for special materials to be used for the manufacturing of the turbine blades, and they're usually made of nickel-based alloys. The function of a jet engine is just not limited to generating thrust, but they help drive accessories that provide power for hydraulics, pneumatics, and electrical mechanisms for use on the engine and various other aircraft systems. There is something called an accessory gearbox, which is mounted on the engine, and the drive for this gearbox is taken usually from the high pressure compressor or shaft. The accessory gearbox contains components like hydraulic pumps, electrical generators, fuel pumps, and so on. Also, modern jet engines are controlled using something called FADEC, stands for Full Authority Digital Engine Control. Now, FADEC is a system that consists of a digital computer called an electronic engine controller, EEC, or the engine control unit, ECU, and its related accessories that control all aspects of engine performance. These are highly sophisticated control devices. Now, in case you're wondering how a jet engine on a modern commercial airliner is started, it is commonly pneumatic, where high pressure air is provided by something called the APU, or the auxiliary power unit, which is a small gas turbine in the back of the aircraft. Or the high pressure air to start the engine can also be derived from an air start unit, which is a piece of ground equipment. The high pressure air drives the starter motor of the engine, which has started. Not all jet engines use pneumatic systems or high pressure air to start. For example, the engines of the Boeing 787 Dreamliner uses electrical starter motors and there are no pneumatic systems involved. All right, so there we have it, a simple overview of the design of an aircraft jet engine and how it works. You see, jet engines have evolved quite a lot over the decades and their reliability today is extremely high. Hence, it has become possible for concepts such as ETOPS, which stands for Extended Twin Operations, to be introduced, where twin jets or aircraft with two engines are flying farther away from airports. And this brings several benefits to airlines and passengers, such as reduction in flight times, saving fuel, reducing carbon emissions, and so on. ETOPS is quite an interesting subject and one we will cover in a future video. But I hope you enjoyed that and it wasn't too difficult to follow. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up and share it along. As always, if you have any questions or comments or you would like a certain topic related to aircraft or flying covered, please put that in the comments below and I will do my best to cover that in a future video. Well, thanks very much for your time and support, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one very soon. Thanks again, and I wish you a great day.